The coming European elections could be the hour of the Conservatives and Reformists group, who are poised to change the balance of power in the European Parliament, where they'll likely have more MEPs. The Conservative parties haven't chosen a lead candidate as they don't believe in the Spitzen candidate system. They no longer want their countries to leave the European Union, but promise to fundamentally change it. Here in Latina, we met with the group's co-president, the Brothers of Italy MEP Nicola Procaccini, who tells us how they'll do it in the global conversation. Thanks for joining us, Nicola Procaccini, Brothers of Italy MEP, candidate in the European elections and co-president of the European Conservatives and Reformists Group. We're in a beautiful museum dedicated to the 20th century, but we're talking about the future of Europe. What's your group's vision of Europe, and is it correct to call you Eurosceptics? No, that's very wrong. We want to go back to the original idea of the European Union, which is an alliance of nations doing a few things together, but important things, doing these things that nation-states alone wouldn't be able to do in the best way. And we fight against those who instead want to change the European Union in a federalist sense, which is not the original model of the European Union. When it was born in 1957 with the Treaty of Rome, the European community was conceived this way. It was conceived as a community of states that should not deal with everything, but with a few things. Instead, unfortunately, over time, there's been an attempt to strip the nations of competencies, bringing them under the umbrella of the European Union. In this way, in our opinion, an attempt has been made to homogenize situations that should not be homogenized. Paradoxically, we then forgot to construct Europe as it was needed. Some parties argue that the right of veto blocks the European Union. You, on the other hand, defend it, if I understand that correctly. Why? We advocate that Europe remain an alliance of nations and not a federalist superstate. The moment you take away the ability of a government to exercise a veto right that compromises its national interest, obviously you are moving toward a federalist superstate. But let me tell you something. To date, it has never happened. It has never happened that there was a veto that made it impossible to enact a regulation, an idea, a directive. What has it produced? A negotiation. It produced negotiations that lasted sometimes days, sometimes weeks, because that is what it should be. The European Union does not have to deal with everything but it can deal with a few important things. That's why dividing Europe into A-list, B-list, C-list and D-list nations goes against the idea of the Europe that we have, an alliance of nations that does a few things, but important things. But the Schuman Declaration of 1950 expressly mentions a European federation. No. Yes. Yes, the European Union was born as a confederation, not as a federation of nations. I'm talking about the Schumann Declaration. No, that is the Vento Tene Manifesto, which is something else. It is the Schumann 1950 Declaration. The merger of the coal and steel production will be the first stage of the European Federation. It's another concept. If we had a way to go into it, I would be able to demonstrate it. It's a self-evident thing that the European Union was not born as a federation, but as a confederation. And it was born precisely on coal and steel, that is, on a few things. For example, the supply of raw materials for energy, which is one of those things where it's clear that if the states get together, they manage to achieve a better performance in terms of the quality of the expenditure, as well as the quality of the energy source, than if they were alone. We can have as many debates as you want. It's unthinkable that anyone would argue that the European Union was born both as the ECSC 
and as the European Community, as a Federalist State, as a United States of Europe. This is something that is totally not real. So, if you want to talk about it, I'm afraid it would take us a little bit off track. No, it was just to mention precisely the Schumann Declaration. I could quote de Gaulle and many other fathers of the European Union who were very clear in this respect. Your group is growing strongly in the polls. You don't have a Spitzenkandidat, a chosen lead candidate. So it begs the question, who would you like to lead the next European Commission? We don't have a Spitzenkandidat for the reason I said before because there is no Spitzenkandidat in the European treaties establishing the European Union. Because the President of the European Commission is chosen by the governments, not by the parties. And we insist on that. We claim the fact that it is the governments who are the only legitimate ones to choose the head of the European Commission, not the parties. This is the main reason. So any other candidate for us is no good, because they're not the candidate of our parliamentary group, but also because the concept is wrong. We continue to want to strip the nations and the governments legitimately elected by people of the powers that are there in black and white in the founding treaties of the European Union. Today in Europe, radical right-wing parties are often accused of not having totally disavowed their links with the dictatorships of the 20th century, for example in Spain with Francoism. Brothers of Italy, your party is often called a post-fascist party in the foreign press. What's your response? Better post-fascist than neo-fascist or other epithets. The truth is that a resolution was voted in the European Parliament that firmly condemns all totalitarianisms of the 20th century. Brothers of Italy, Vox, all parties of all right-wing groups voted for it. Conversely, the left voted against it especially the Italian Democratic Party, evidently to defend communism. We condemn them all. In these five years under the Ursula von der Leyen Commission, what have you liked and disliked? Very little, because it was an almost essentially left-wing European Commission, so much so that Franz Timmermans had even more power than Ursula von der Leyen, even being able to implement the Commission's main governing programme, the Green Deal. Fortunately, this is something that will no longer be possible, because no matter how the European elections go, we already know that the next European Commission will be centre-right, because the Commissioners are appointed by the governments, they're not appointed by the elections, and the governments are centre-right. But as Conservatives, would you be willing to support von der Leyen or another EPP candidate? This is something we have to see based on the balance of power, because they might be the ones who have to support one of our candidates. So let's see. If you had to choose one goal for the Brothers of Italy and the European Conservatives and Reformist Group for the next Parliament, what would you choose? One goal? Definitely stop illegal immigration and put human beings back at the centre of nature. The Italian government, led by a Conservative party, supported and approved the Asylum and Migration Pact, the reform of European migration policy. The Polish government, when it was led by a Conservative party and even now, is strongly opposed to it. Is the redistribution of asylum seekers a divisive issue for you, Conservatives? The current Polish government voted against it. And the previous one as well. This is a key passage because the current government is from the EPP and supported by the socialists. It voted against it. Their parliamentary representations voted against it. We think that this pact is still not the right way to deal with illegal immigration and immigration in general, but objectively it is a first step in the right direction. That's why we voted for it and supported it. It's finally going in the direction that Giorgia Maloney has been advocating for years. However, she was considered a dangerous extremist and fascist who wanted to drown people. What is the solution? 
The solution is to stop the departures, because by the time the migrants are on European soil, it's too late. The talk of placement and distribution is one that should not even be made. If we are able to determine upstream who is entitled and who is not entitled to asylum, we can let in only those who are entitled. At that point, we are talking about 15% of the overall total of illegal immigration. We will then be able to break up the most odious business there is, which is that of traffickers, and at the same time, we will be able to govern a phenomenon that needs to be governed, because legal immigration is something that all nations need, but it must be limited in quantity, and if possible, there must be also choice. Migrants must also be trained from a professional point of view. This serves the host nation, and it also serves the migrant, who at that point is not forced to put himself on the margins of our society or become a worker for organized crime, but can instead find a place in our societies that is decent for him as well. We're surrounded in this museum by beautiful cars, vintage cars with combustion engines. After 2035, will cars with such engines just be museum pieces in Europe, or is there still hope for change? There is still hope, should what we hope for prevail, which is the concept of technology neutrality. What does that mean? The example of the thermal combustion engine and the electric motor fits well. Through biofuels, which are zero emission as an ultimate balance, it is possible for the thermal combustion engine to survive without necessarily having to surrender to another technology, that of the electric engine, for which we don't have sovereignty in terms of the production chain. What does technology neutrality mean? It means sharing a goal, but leaving the freedom for nations to choose the best technology according to their own specifics. This is a concept that is close to our hearts and one that we will strongly support in the coming years. But in the approved regulation, biofuels aren't there. No, they are not. Are you aiming for a waiver? Absolutely, yes. Let's stay on this issue and talk about neutrality. The Conservatives and Reformists have opposed almost all of the European Green Deal measures. Do you share the goal of climate neutrality by 2050? We share the goal of having the least possible impact on the environment and nature. This has to be done with common sense, with balance. These are two concepts, common sense and balance, that have been totally banished by the European policy in recent years, sacrificed on the altar of a perverse ideological furore that has caused CO2 emissions to rise because they rose in 2023 despite having plummeted in the European Union. This has caused a devastation of our competitiveness as well as a devastation of the environment and nature. Right now, owners of the green transition, those who are making it, are the Chinese, who are benefiting competitively from European choices. At the same time, they are not at all concerned about the environmental standards that we are concerned about. Because then the batteries, the photovoltaic panels, are made from coal-fired power plants without giving a damn about anything else. So is it too much to aspire to climate neutrality by 2050? I think it's a goal within reach, but it has to be done with common sense. The case of biofuels is an example of how common sense is being pushed aside. This raises questions. The fact that an environmentally neutral technology is banned and not considered by institutions makes you think that the economic interests are behind it. 
Italy is the country that has benefited the most in numerical terms from next generation EU, so far the only joint debt issuance in the history of the European Union. Would you be in favour of new future common debt schemes? Let me say that unfortunately Italy is the biggest beneficiary because, being the one that came out worst from the pandemic according to the established algorithm, it consequently had more resources. After that, the so-called Eurobonds are an invention of the Italian centre-right. Giulio Tremonti, a former minister in the Berlusconi government and now Brothers of Italy deputy, was the first who spoke of common debt in Europe. So with us, he has broken through an open door in this respect. Viktor Orbán's Fidesz party is close to your positions on many issues, but not on the war in Ukraine. Do you think it could join the European Conservatives and Reformists after the elections? In the meantime, let me say that Viktor Orbán's government voted together with all the other 26 European states in favour of all aid packages to the Ukrainian people, both economic and military, from the first to the last, by slowing them down. He slowed them down because he was trying to assert his own right, that of not being politically discriminated against, as has happened in recent years under the guise of the rule of law. So much so that the last aid shipment was unblocked when it was put in black and white that Article 7, the one on the rule of law, not be used as an ideological weapon to target a government just because it's of a different political colour than the socialist one. Do you totally rule out Brothers of Italy joining the European People's Party? Yes, I totally rule it out. We are the ECR. We have invested a lot in this political family, in this political tradition. We will defend it tooth and nail.